Order members, it's time now for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Uh, and can I advise members that question 13 has been withdrawn? And I call John Dallet. Uh, question again, last can Carla Ledger Hull. Question number one, Deputy Speaker, if you please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I, I would like to answer questions one, four, and seven together as they relate to the same issue of the impact of the Stormont House Agreement. The Stormont House Agreement provided up to £500 million over, what, over 10 years of new capital funding to support shared and integrated education. This funding will have an impact on the education budget. Individual projects must be agreed between the Executive and the UK Government. In addition to £50 million uh, for shared and integrated education projects, the Stormont House Agreement provided up to £30 million in 2015-16 for bodies dealing with the past. It also confirmed the capital the resource flexibility sought in the 2015-16 draft budget, increased this to allow a further £100 million of RRI borrowing to be used to fund the voluntary exit scheme, provided an additional £100 million of RRI borrowing for capital projects, and provided the flexibility to pay the £114 million welfare reform penalty from capital. The impact of the Stormont House Agreement on 2015-16 has been incorporated into the Budget 15-16, which I announced on the 19th of January. I call John Dallet for something. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive answer. The Minister, of course, will be aware that there are roughly a quarter of a million people out there between 16 and 64 who have levels of literacy and numeracy that are well below what they could apply for a job or seek promotion or even educate their children. Minister, are you sure we are not going to create another generation of children who will leave school not able to read or write? Well, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, right, clearly it is no one's desire in this House to see anyone condemned to uh, sort of educational underachievement that the member has outlined. Um, and I think we would all accept from whatever quarter in this House that um, West Northern Ireland has a, a very good education system, that there are many who uh, come through our education system with the highest of qualifications and, and are, are, um, are able to convert those qualifications into good university education, university degrees, and also into well-paying jobs, um, that there are some who unfortunately slip through the net. Uh, and I think that is something that uh, we should all be deeply concerned about, uh, something why is one of the reasons why uh, I was very pleased last week um, to boost the Department of Education's allocation in the budget, uh, an uplift of, of £63 million for the aggregated schools budget, which the Minister has then further topped up by a reallocation within his own budget to take that to, to £80 million, uh, an allocation which, of course, uh, the Member's own party voted against uh, in the Executive. Uh, and, I, and I hope that they have a chance tomorrow with a, a debate on the budget to, to rectify that position uh, and support the education budget and an increase in the education budget. Uh, we've also further boosted the um, Department of Employment and Learning's budget as well, uh, with allocations of around £35 million proposed within the budget. And some of those, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, are uh, ch successful change fund bids, one of which is actually deliberately uh, for 14 to 16 year olds who have uh, issues and problems with uh, educational achievement. And that is a joint project between the Department of Employment and Learning and the Department, Department of uh, Education. I think that's exactly the sort of project and scheme that I wanted to see coming forward through the change fund, and I think it's exactly the sort of scheme that this House should be supporting. I call Oliver McMullen. <laughs> I call Oliver McMullen. Thank you, um, thank you uh, for that answer. Can I um, ask you on, on the spend within your budget? Uh, I wrote a, a table of question to you, but maybe I can get it quicker today. On the spend not there within the ambulance service. Where do you see that money going? Will you hand it to the Minister of Health, or what way is that money distributed to all the ambulance stations? Can I remind members of the questions on the education budget? Uh, uh, Minister may wish to comment. I, I can't specifically. I mean, the the um, Health uh, Minister has received, as the House will be aware, additional uh, spending next year of £204 million over and above uh, his allocation for 2014-15. to 15. That re represents a 3.4 per cent increase. Uh, the executive took, I think, the right decision in not completely protecting 
uh, DHSSPS's budget, but protected around 95% of that department's budget um, by um, protecting frontline health and social services um, provision, and that would include, um, as one of the, uh, I think it's six trusts, the Ambulance Services Trust. So it has a, been afforded a degree of protection. It is a matter entirely, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the Minister of Health as to where he spends that additional allocation that he has received. And even though um, that department would be perceived, Deputy Speaker, as one of the, the winners to use that phrase within the budget, I know that the Minister of Health, who I think is in the House later answering questions, would be the first to say that in spite of getting an additional £204 million, it is still a departmental budget. Uh, which, because of demand and changing demographics, is one that is continually under pressure, even over and above a 3.5 per cent increase in, in its budget. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister um, how he will ensure, in fact, guarantee that this very warm um, welcome additional funding, um, capital money, will make a real and substantial uh, advance in the current uh, um, pattern of segregated education uh, throughout Northern Ireland? Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I take it the, the member is referring to the additional allocation in terms of capital spend for, for shared and integrated education, because of course his ministers at the executive voted against the increase in allocation to the uh, Department of Education over, over and above the, the draft budget allocation. Um, the shared and integrated uh, education, the boost of um, £50 million pounds a year, I think is very, very welcome over, over the next 10-year period, uh, specifically for shared and integrated education projects. Um, we are still working through with um, Her Majesty's Government the criteria that would be applied to make sure that they uh, pass the test in terms of, of, of meeting the criteria that will be set for them in terms of being genuine shared and uh, integrated education projects. I think it's important uh, as we take these forward. I think there are a lot of good shared education schemes that are starting to, to work their way through, through the system. There was a, a call by the Minister of Education last year for ones to come forward. Some of those have uh, passed muster and, and are now receiving um, capital funding, um, not just this year, but also in, in future years as well. Um, it is important, I think, that we, one of the tests, one of the criteria that we apply to this additional funding, Deputy Speaker, is that it, it is capable of saving us money. Uh, and, and I think whilst there are our other objectives around shared education in terms of bringing children from different backgrounds together to be educated in the one place, uh, we can't lose sight of the fact as well that this is money that is there to help us to save money in the longer term. Uh, and in that sense, the shared education projects not only being of good uh, social and educational value also will have to save us money in terms of our budget because, as the member knows and the House knows, um, in spite of what is, I think, a much better budget than the draft budget and better budget than we thought we might have been able to bring forward, there are still huge pressures moving forward, not least in, in the education sphere. So it's important that the projects that do come forward also help us to save some money. I call Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And I'm just wondering, does the Minister share the concern expressed by some that the uh, executive is now too dependent upon borrowing? Sir, Deputy Speaker, it was a, a point that was picked up by uh, some during the debate last week, or the, the statement after the statement last week um, around the budget, that the executive is now um, borrowing around £1.8 billion, pounds, and on the face of it, that's a lot of money. Um, it does, it com uh, compares unfavourably if you do a per uh, head of the population calculation compared to the other devolved uh, administrations in Scotland and in Wales. First point that's worth noting is that both Scotland and Wales would like to be able to borrow more, particularly in Wales. I met with the Welsh Finance Minister earlier this month. Uh, her administration is only allowed to borrow £400 million, and she would like to borrow a lot more than that. It's actually quite envious of our ability to, to borrow up to £3 billion. The £1.8 billion that we have borrowed to date uh, has been able to finance infrastructure projects that otherwise, Mr Deputy Speaker, would not have been able to be financed. Um, and we have also been able to capitalise some costs around the Northern Ireland Civil Service Equal Pay Claim uh, and bring forward a rescue package for the Presbyterian Mutual Society. Again, that would not have been done uh, and been able to be done without that ability to borrow that money. And as we move forward, whilst yes, there is a cost. Uh, in terms of repaying the interest annually of around three to four million pounds per uh, 100 million pounds that we borrow, um, it is significant, and I think 
has changed the executive's approach to borrowing, that the £700 million flexibility that we are allowed with our RRI borrowing to borrow specifically for a voluntary exit scheme will save for every £100 million we spend uh, around £60 million. So about half a billion pounds for that £700 million will be saved. And that obviously puts a very different complexion upon borrowing moving forward than it might have done without that payback that there will come from a voluntary exit scheme. I call Danny Kinnan. Speaker, I mean, the Minister himself uh, said that the budget was imperfect and there's much in it um, that many of us disagree with. But what's the extent of the remaining pressures that are on the Department of Education? Mr. Deputy Speaker, again, uh, a question um, better directed at the, the Minister of Education himself. I did have uh, conversations with uh, the Minister of Education, as, as indeed I, I did have a meeting with all ministers um, leading up to um, discussions and agreement around the budget. Uh, and I understand that the Minister himself was bringing forward pressures of £160 million within the budget. It had been reduced by, by under £100 million in the draft budget. I think there was roughly another £60 million worth of pressures. Now, I'm sure that if the member and I were to pour over all of those pressures, we may not um, be in agreement with the Minister of Education that they were all legitimate pressures or that the totality of them were legitimate in terms of, of, of the cost pressures being placed upon that department. Um, but very, very clearly, the additional allocation of £60 million, which was the, the lion's share, as I described it, of that additional money that was being allocated will go some way to help the Minister um, to um, particularly, and I think this is, this is my primary concern, I think it, it ought to have been the, the House's primary concern, that the impact of reductions in expenditure, which the Department will still face, um, should be limited away from the classroom. Uh, and certainly that £63 million allocation, which the Members' Party uh, also voted against, um, topped up by additional allocation by uh, the Minister of Education himself to a total of £80 million, will certainly um, assist in, in ensuring that the classroom is protected and defended uh, in the next financial year. Moving on, I call Raymond McCartney. Question number two, please. With your permission, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to answer questions 2, 3, 5 and 12 together, as they all relate to the transfer of corporation tax rate setting powers. As I'm sure members are aware, the UK Government introduced the Corporation Tax Northern Ireland Bill into the House of Commons on the 8th of January 2015. This will enable the transfer of corporation tax rate setting powers to the Northern Ireland Assembly from April 2017. The passage of the bill through the UK Parliament is uh, conditional on the implementation of key measures to deliver sustainable finances for Northern Ireland. And therefore, while I welcome the progress that has been made so far, this momentum must be maintained. In terms of the proposed design of the Northern Ireland regime, the, Her Majesty's Government has indicated that it is confident that this will be Azores compliant. That view has been reached because Northern Ireland has institutional autonomy and it has its own administrative status. It will have procedural autonomy since this Assembly will have the ability to set a rate free from Westminster influence. And furthermore, it will have economic autonomy because the block grant here will be adjusted to reflect the corporation tax revenues foregone by Her Majesty's Government. With regards to the economic impact, research commissioned by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment demonstrates a very strong case for reducing corporation tax. The research conducted by Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre suggests that if a reduced rate of 12.5% was implemented from April 2017, productivity would be 5.9% higher by 2033 than it otherwise would have been. In addition, the economy would be 11% larger and 37,500 net new jobs would be created. Of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, the potential benefits and associated costs of a reduced corporation tax will depend on the rate that is struck and the timing of when that lower rate might be applied. Ultimately, these will be matters for the Executive and Assembly to decide in due course. I call Raymond McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive answer? In relation to one of the procedures, and that's the ability to lower or strike the appropriate rate. Does the Minister agree with the, the, the court decision that that should be a matter for the Assembly without any external in interference? I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a key condition, Deputy Speaker, of the Azores ruling, as well as having economic and um, uh, administrative uh, autonomy that we are able to, we are able to set procedurally uh, our own level of um, corporation tax. And obviously, that's a, 
um, a matter for but something that the executive will have to ponder and consider and decide upon actually very very quickly um, our budgets for the next three or four years after 2015-16 um, will be largely set out by the comprehensive spending re review that whatever administration uh, is formed in uh, London after the general election in May. Um, you never know who might be involved in, uh, in influencing that. Um, we'll have a comprehensive spending review that will cover three or four years, and that will obviously overlap with the, the timing in terms of our ability to reduce corporation tax rate from uh, April 2017 onwards. But very, very clearly over the next um, six months or, or so, um, this assembly, this executive, will have to take a very clear decision about where it wants to go in respect of, of this issue. Um, there is a, a wealth of evidence out there in terms of the benefits that there are, and, and it doesn't matter what piece of research is done, they are more or less the same in terms of the benefits that there would be to Northern Ireland. Um, and clearly there are issues that we have to consider around cost and, and how we might pay for uh, the inevitable reduction in our block grant. But these are issues that the executive will have to ponder and the executive will recommend to this assembly. Um, but the member is absolutely right. These are entirely in, in the hands of executive min ministers and members of this assembly. I call Trevor Lum. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I apologise. It was quite hard to hear the minister down here today for some reason. But I think he said that um, a 12.5 per cent rate of corporation tax would produce an estimated productivity gain of 5.9 per cent. Um, how does he square that, or would he agree with his ministerial colleague, the Minister for Enterprise, who gave the opinion recently that um, an inc uh, the int introduction of corporation tax would actually produce a £3,000 per annum increase in the average wage packet? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, 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 result, or the, the work carried out by the, the Ulster University's Northern Ireland Economic um, Policy Centre it follows on from work carried out by others by Oxford Economics. In fact, it actually builds on the work that was done by Oxford Economics in the past. And this piece of work suggests that there will be a net new job increase of 37,500, so nearly 40,000 jobs, which is not far off previous estimates as well. It does show that there would be an increase in productivity by around 2033 by 5.9%, and that the economy as a whole would grow by 11%. Now, the issue, I think, was, was not well reported by the BBC in terms of what the Enterprise Minister said in terms of increases in salaries. And, and very clearly, if your economy is growing, and it, it's growing by over 11 per cent, um, if you are bringing in 40,000 new jobs, and those new jobs are going to be higher paid new jobs, the average effect across the economy would be around 3,000 of an increase in, in salaries. So you know, there, there is undoubtedly the case, if the economy is growing, if you are bringing in more jobs and they are higher paid jobs, there will be an increase in um, average salaries across Northern Ireland. That is something that those of us who have been um, very supportive of the devolution of corporation tax, that's what we've wanted to see. That is backed up by the research that has been carried out by various institutions on our behalf and indeed not on our behalf. Uh, and that's something that, you know, that's the, that is the prize of corporation tax. There is a cost involved and there will be difficult decisions required around that. But the benefits of doing it, particularly when you look at what other states who have reduced, particularly the south of Ireland, what they have been able to do in terms of reducing their corporation tax rate and the investment that that has brought, and even in very difficult times, was still the backbone of, a, of their economy and is now boosting their economy in, into growth. Um, this is a prize that is worth pursuing uh, and will, I hope, result in not just 40,000 new jobs, but more and further investment by local firms as well as attracting in foreign direct investment. I call Patsy McLone. Question, colleague. We have selection error come I. In regard to the introduction of a lowered corporation tax, uh, can the minister advise as to what measures will be taken or can be taken to ensure that uh, existing regional economic imbalances won't be exacerbated? Well, Mr. Deputy, sorry, I'm not sure what procedurally has, has, has happened in terms of who's been, been called, um, but the reduced rate of corporation tax will apply to all firms across Northern Ireland, irrespective of, of where they are located. And, you know, I've had occasion to visit the members' uh, constituency, indeed Mr. McRae's constituency as well, um, and visiting some of our, our biggest manufacturers who are based in that. And I think it's one of our, our sort of almost well-hidden secrets that 40% um, of the world's mobile screening equipment is made in, in County Tyrone. Uh, and there are firms who have already invested there, I think, who would be well-placed to expand 
uh, and Northern Ireland within the, the sort of group portfolio that many of those, because uh, there's Swedish-owned companies, American-owned companies operating in County Tyrone, um, who would perhaps see a reduced rate of corporation tax as an opportunity to expand their operations there. So uh, this is not a, a policy that will is particularly aimed at benefiting one part of Northern Ireland over another. Indigenous firms, irrespective of where they're located, will be paying a lower rate of corporation tax, and clearly it is up to all of us right across Northern Ireland, aided and assisted by Invest Northern Ireland, but also with the new local government institutions in place to try to work to attract investment into whether it be Mid Ulster or, or whatever part of Northern Ireland. So I think it is something that will reap benefits for everyone in Northern Ireland and all parts of Northern Ireland. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. A lot has been talked about budgets and trying to uh, sort out um, departmental budgets. Can the Minister outline what work has been done in respect of preparing for any reduction that may come about um, uh, with um, the reduction in um, corporation tax? Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's no, there's, um, there's no work as such included within the 2015-16 budget, which is um, delayed before the House last week and we debated tomorrow. Um, and that's because we, we don't have to deal with the reduction in the block grant. It won't come until we have reduced the rate of corporation tax here in Northern Ireland, and there is that, that gap then. And that won't be it in, until its earliest, until the financial year 2017-18, uh, as I pointed out to Mr McCartney earlier, uh, as the executive plans for whether it be a three- or a four-year budget coming out of the next comprehensive spending review. That is obviously something that we will have to bear in mind in crafting that budget, which will actually have to be done um, towards the end part of this year. What I was keen to do, and the executive uh, agreed, though it was important that the, the budget for 15-16 do as much as it can in order to plan in a, in a more material way for, rather than re the, the reduction in, in spending, but in terms of skills and, and continuing to attract investment. And a lot of the now that we have the legislation proceeding through Westminster, it is it is a good time for Invest Northern Ireland to change what it does and go out and sell Northern Ireland as a place to invest in anticipation of a lower. Uh, rate of corporation tax. That's why I was keen to support and enhance their budget, uh, and their budget has increased by, by over 10 per cent next year. Um, similarly, it is important that we still create a pipeline of skilled workers who are the engine of, of any economy. Uh, and whilst we weren't able to um, fill in all of the hole and the gap within the Department of Employment and Learning, uh, there's been targeted investment of around £35 million in, in key areas, including the development of more skills in conjunction with the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. So, in that regard, whilst the budget doesn't particularly deal uh, with corporation tax, it, it does deal with aspects including skills and economic development, which are preparing us for the day whenever uh, we do have a reduced rate of corporation tax and the economy uh, hopefully grows as a result. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Um, I, I wonder, in terms of setting a rate, whether the Minister feels it's a question of matching the Republic, bettering the Republic, or, or whether it's a question of ensuring that those making the investment decisions uh, feel that any differential uh, has become irrelevant, given the other benefits, such as the skilled workforce, that would be accruing to investors here in Northern Ireland. These are, Mr. Deputy Speaker, these are important points that are, are very much worthy of discussion, and the executive would be wrong to proceed just directly to a particular rate because that's the rate that it has in, has in mind. And there are, you know, and I, I think it's um, worth noting that over the last number of years, whilst we haven't been able to compete for some of the higher end, higher tech jobs of the Irish Republic, uh, we have competed pretty well, uh, and, and we stand out in a UK context as the uh, second best region outside you know, London being the number one for attracting in foreign direct investment per, per head of the population. That's something I think that we should be very proud of in Northern Ireland. And that is testimony to, uh, for example, our skilled workforce, but it's also testimony to some of the other policies that this executive has pursued around uh, high-speed broadband access, around um, um, ensuring that uh, there's good collaboration between our universities and our colleges and business. And there's also other costs which are not affected by the executive directly, such as um, the the low rate of um, the low rental cost of, of office accommodation and grade A office accommodation, particularly in, in Belfast City Centre. Um, so there are other reasons which do attract in investment into Northern Ireland, and they are issues uh, that I think have to be factored into any conversation and ultimately decision that the executive makes around uh, what rate of corporation tax it wants to set. Now that we have the the, the ability to do that. Moving on, I call David McNary. Uh, question six. 
So, Deputy Speaker, my department has introduced a range of shared services in relation to HR, training and IT, which were previously the responsibility of individual departments and together realise efficiencies of around £12 million per year. My department has also recently commissioned an independent review of Northern Ireland Civil Service's HR arrangements that will make recommendations on the future HR organisational structures and staffing levels. This may result in further rationalisation. Following on from the Stormont House Agreement, I am considering a range of measures aimed at helping departments live within their 2015-16 budget and beyond for consideration by the Executive. The proposed reduction in the number of departments will also assist in the process of rationalising functions. I call David McNary for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I appreciate the Minister's answer. Uh, could he give a, a timescale now for the rationalisation of the current departments down to nine? and perhaps outline their envisaged central functions? Uh, the, I very much welcome the reduction in, um, in the number of executive departments, something that my party um, thought was wrong back in 1999 when the current 10 departments uh, were created. Um, whenever um, we've been consistent in this House, in fact, one of the, the first motions that I brought in, into this House as a, as a backbencher was calling for a reduction in the number of departments. Um, I'm very glad that that is now happening, uh, and that will certainly be able to. The executive will be able to save some money as a result of that rationalisation. Um, it will not be enough, unfortunately, to deal with the, the various budgetary problems that we have. I think the, the, the bigger prize actually is that, um, particularly in areas where there has been disjointment, a, a disjointed approach in terms of policy and policy development and policy implementation, that will be brought under the auspices of one department moving forward. And should therefore, um, it's not just about about. Um, you know, cheaper government, it's about smarter government as well. And that's a, well, some, it's something I, I welcome and very much welcome the, the savings that will accrue from that. It's not something that's been taken forward by my department. Uh, it has been taken forward by Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. But the executive discussed this issue last week and things are proceeding and proceeding positively. Uh, and I expect um, that when legislation is brought to this House and hopefully passed, that we'll be in a position to see a reduction in the number of government departments from the start of the, the new mandate in 2016. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what opportunities exist to expand the use of shared services across the public sector? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the um, executive parties, the five parties, agreed on the 19th of uh, December a range of um, reform and restructuring measures, which went to the uh, Her Majesty's Government as part of our negotiations and discussion around the Stormont House Agreement. I then subsequently developed that into a reform and restructuring plan, which has uh, gone to and passed the executive last Thursday. And that includes various elements. It includes a, a voluntary exit scheme, which was mentioned earlier, um, but it also includes uh, the expansion of shared services. Because whilst there has been a lot of um, consolidation, rationalisation at a central departmental level, that hasn't always expanded out into arm's length bodies and other agencies. So, uh, the, the executive has now agreed that every central government um, body should be brought onto um, shared services platforms whenever contracts permit. And that also, interestingly, that local government, given where they are in terms of reform, should also be encouraged to avail of the opportunities that our shared services around IT and HR and networks and other areas uh, present for them to save money and save money very, very quickly, actually, as well. I call Joe Byrne. I thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister give an assurance to people in the public service that the voluntary exit scheme will be a voluntary scheme and administered in a fair and equitable way within the functional needs of the public service in general? Yeah. Sir, Deputy Speaker, I have no, no difficulty in, in confirming that a voluntary exit scheme will be voluntary. Um, it will be a four-year scheme. Um, again, the Executive has agreed various outline um, issues around it. We have agreed to create a transformation fund which will be administered by a steering group headed up by the head of the civil service. Um, and it will be a four-year scheme. Um, and the £700 million pounds that has been, uh, the flexibility that has been permitted by the Stormont House Agreement will allow us to populate that fund. And we will hopefully be, um, there's some agreement has still to be reached in some of the mechanics of it all, but after we've had consultation with the trade unions, uh, it will hopefully, hopefully be open for uh, applications uh, from around March of this year, um, with the first uh, civil servants, public servants leaving uh, and availing of the voluntary exit scheme around about the, the end of the summer, early autumn period. 
And that is the end of the period for listed questions, and now we move on to topical questions. And I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And many of the earlier questions were around uh, the uh, budget for the year ahead. Minister, could you give us any in insight into the programme for government for the year ahead, and particularly across DSD, if there is going to be, as predicted, a fall off from the executive target of 2,000 social houses to 1,500 in the year ahead? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm sure you have noticed as, as well as me as well. This is uh, supposedly questions to the Minister of, of Finance personnel. It, it is morphed very quickly into questions for virtually every other minister within the executive. Um, the programme for government and updating the programme for government and extending it by a further year because of the extension in our mandate isn't a responsibility of, of my department. It is a responsibility of the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister to take forward. Um, it is that extension by a year, whilst there will be some new targets that will be put in, uh, and I know that uh, my own department will be adding in uh, additional targets for a revised programme for government. Many of the existing targets will have already been met and therefore don't need to continue. Some of them do continue, um, and the budget has a bearing on those targets because uh, departments don't know whether they can achieve the, an extension of that target if they don't have the same amount of money within their budget going towards that particular area of spend. So now that the budget is set for, for next year and subject to agreement obviously by the House tomorrow, that allows the uh, various departments to proceed with updating, revising, changing, altering whatever is required, uh, the programme for government targets that are relevant to them. I call Dolores Kelly for supplementary. Um, I hear the chastisement in the Minister's response, but uh, given that it is the cart before the horse, uh, per usual in this Assembly, it should come as no surprise that I should ask such questions. Therefore, Minister, in relation to your own portfolio, could you tell me what is your ambition for the year ahead in asset sales and how much do you hope to raise? The Executive um, has set a target in the budget of around £158 million pounds of capital receipts, which includes asset sales. Um, the original um, draft budget proposal uh, that came forward from officials was around it was 108 million, um, and we thought that that was um, not ambitious enough. Uh, so we've increased that by uh, that target by by 50 million pounds. Um, sometimes, in terms of terminology, uh, we talk about that 158 million pound as asset sales. It's not all asset sales. Some of it will be the repayment of, for example. Um, financial transactions capital that has been lent out to the private sector will be coming back and the repayments come back in as, as capital receipts. So do um, repayment of um, co-ownership loans and things like that and some other housing aspects as well. So there's a target which I don't think is uh, too ambitious of uh, having had 108 million already identified to expand that by roughly 50 per cent to take that up by another 50 million. Um, where the market is at this minute in time with uh, some, some activity starting to move and assets starting to sell, I, I think it's not an unreasonable target for us to ha have, and I hope that we, um, and trust that we will make it, uh, and that money will be able to be used then for investment in, in, in capital elsewhere. And I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that some of the, most, uh, the largest contracts available to businesses in Northern Ireland would be those contracts that are coming out of government and government departments. I just wonder if the minister would outline what success local companies have in accessing those contracts. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the executive spends roughly 2.7, 2.8 billion pounds a year in terms of contracts for goods and services and for, for capital projects. Um, between April and December of 2014, so the first nine months of, of last year, uh, Centres of Procurement Expertise in Northern Ireland awarded 2,277 contracts, which had a total value of around £1.2 billion. Interestingly, 83 per cent of those contracts were awarded to SMEs, uh, and 75 per cent of contracts were awarded to Northern Ireland firms. So, um, I think the perception sometimes is that Northern Ireland firms don't win in our government procurement system. Uh, I think a situation where Three quarters are going to Northern Ireland firms, and 83% are going to SMEs, which is obviously dominating our economy. Shows that they, our um, government procurement system is open for business and very much open for local business. I call Robin Newton. Thank the minister for those uh, for his answer, and certainly those statistics are, are very encouraging. Can, can the minister outline perhaps any more specific steps that he is taking that might indeed further encourage? 
uh, Northern Ireland companies, in particular SMEs, to secure contracts with government? Mr. Speaker, well, well, some, uh, I think the, the, those figures, those statistics, are, are probably quite revealing for many people who, who, who think that the numbers would instinctively think the numbers are much, much lower uh, than 75% being awarded to Northern Ireland firms. Um, it's not some. It's not a situation where I think we can rest on our laurels. I think we should be doing everything that we possibly can uh, within the law, um, which is very much governed by um, EU directives, which have changed and are in the, currently in the process of changing. Are changing, Deputy Speaker, I believe, in a way that will assist um, local firms and SMEs to, to gain more um, contracts. Um, a couple of things that I can, I can think of that we are actively involved in in trying to encourage our small, medium-sized enterprises to get involved in procurement, because many of them, I think, are put off by the, the size and scale of them, and perhaps even sometimes the complexity. Uh, CPD, Centre Procurement Directorate, has been working very closely with Intertrade Ireland, uh, who uh, run, run several Meet the Buyer events uh, um, across Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland each year. I attended one recently at the Ramada Hotel in, in Shaw's Bridge, um, and there was um, several hundred local um, uh, there was lots of public sector buyers from both sides of the border, um, and there were lots over hundreds and hundreds of local companies speaking to them about what they offer, what they could, and just just having a good conversation about what might be possible. And, and I think a lot of business uh, was done at that and done as a result of, of, of all of that. Another way in which I'm trying to simplify the process so that local SMEs can see much more clearly what work is going on is to. Um, launching a new tendering system in April of this year, which will be called eTenders NI, and that will simplify and standardise our approach, making it easier for um, firms in Northern Ireland to complete tenders. So anything that we can do digitally, process-wise, or just introducing uh, local firms with those within the public sector on both sides of the border, actually, I think there's huge opportunities for us to sell and Northern Ireland firms to sell into the Irish Republic as well. I think it's something that we'll continue to, to pursue. I now call John Dallat. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I know the Minister will be as disturbed as I am at the upsurge in criminal activity of paramilitary groups leading to the murder of Brian Michael Haga and Balamoni. Is the Minister satisfied that these people are not getting money out of the meagre resources of this Assembly, masquerading as community workers, political researchers or all the other lofty titles that they may give themselves? You know, I think Mr. Deputy Speaker, we would be all very concerned, all very worried. If any public funds or indeed any funds, whatever uh, the direction they were coming from, were finding their way into the, the pockets of, of criminal gangs, of paramilitary organisations, irrespective of what community they come from, um, because as a member would agree with me, people, whether they be loyalists in their persuasion or Republican in their persuasion, have, have nothing to offer this country. They only wish to, to drag us back. Uh, there is no support within the community for what they do. Uh, and that's why I'm very, very keen that, as I'm sure the whole House is, in pursuing all of those who are involved in paramilitary activity, those, of, those who are involved in criminal activity should be pursued and brought to justice. Uh, I think it's very important that the Minister of Justice, who has been trying to take forward Deputy Speaker proposals in respect of extending the remit of the National Crime Agency uh, to Northern Ireland, um, that that happens and that happens forthwith, uh, because with the support of the National Crime Agency and a whole range of crimes, some, some hideous crimes that um, have been uh, in, the, in the media where the assistance of the National Crime Agency elsewhere in the United Kingdom has been able to bring people to justice, but that has been denied to us here in Northern Ireland. I think it is high time that those who have been a roadblock in this place to the NCA extending its remit to Northern Ireland uh, that that resistance um, yields and allows us to get the benefits of the NCA operating here in Northern Ireland. Yeah. I call John Dallet for supplementary. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer, which I accept has been absolutely uh, genuine. You may know that King John in his day had a triple lock on his chest of gold. Despite the best efforts, perhaps, is the Minister not uh, intend or, or not satisfied that we really need to redouble our efforts if this assembly is to have a fair wind and is free from paramilitaries and all their activities. But, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I have no, certainly no evidence has come to me uh, in recent times about money being spent by whatever source within the public sector, certainly within the, the remit of, of, of this executive 
going into dissident republicans or indeed any paramilitary organisations. Uh, if members do have evidence of that, I would um, encourage and urge them immediately to raise that with the appropriate minister or with myself, and I'd pass it on. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the audit situation that we have in terms of many funds, I'm um, thinking particularly of the, the Peace Fund, uh, Peace 3, Peace 4, um, as it will now be, um, sometimes some within the community complain of it being too rigorous and, and, and too difficult. And I think that it is important to balance testing properly with you know, ensuring that people can go about their, their business. Those who are legitimate can, can do it without uh, having too much difficulty. So sometimes I think what we do in terms of scrutinising the work can sometimes be criticised as being a little bit too rigorous and too onerous. Um, but given the difficulties that we have experienced in Northern Ireland in the past, whether uh, and some um, difficulties that there, there may even currently be, I think it's still important that we ensure that that level of scrutiny is there. I call Samuel Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister will be pleased that I'll not be putting a question to him because he has, because he has already answered it. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Ian Milne is not in his place. I call Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, um, I wonder could the Minister outline uh, what are the implications for EU funding uh, in relation to waste to energy uh, were the Molusk plant not to go ahead? So there was a little bit of noise in the chamber, I think. But what was I think he was asking was what are the plans for that money if it doesn't go ahead? Applications for EU funding were not to win. There, there is no. Um, there, there may well be in terms of the, the, the particular project that the member raises. Um, it is a, a large project which will, if it goes ahead, obviously it is subject to, to planning permission and, and has to go through. Um, various processes in respect of that, and I, I certainly wouldn't want in my position to be uh, influencing that, that one, or be seen to be influencing that one way or the other. Um, I am not aware, although I wouldn't rule out there being the possibility of EU funding being secured by the developers of that scheme. Um, the only interaction that I have had with that scheme is, has been through the budget um, and a bid that was put in by uh, the Department of the Environment. Um, who are working with the Strategic Investment Board for the development of a bid that may, uh, may use uh, financial transactions capital, which is, of course, a source of capital funding that we receive as an executive from, from Westminster and not from Europe. I call for the McKinney for supplementary. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. Uh, but maybe just get it home this a little bit. Um, my understanding was that there was money set aside in the executive, and basically what I'm asking is, there any, is, is were it not to go ahead, is there flexibility for it to be spent elsewhere? I, 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 sort of, yeah, I think we've been sort of cross-purposes, and I thought that was perhaps initially what he, he was asking. And he, he mentioned the European funding, which sort of confused me a little. Um, there is an allocation of, um, an indicative allocation of 50 million aside that project. Now, that project developed as a result of work that was being carried out by uh, the member's own minister's department and the Department of the Environment, who had been working with the Strategic Investment Board and had identified it as a, a possible project which could avail of financial transactions capital. And the member will be aware that the, the House has had, or the, my department has had difficulty in allocating all of our financial transactions capital both in, in year, uh, and thankfully we're able to deposit around £40 million pounds to the University of Ulster, sorry, Ulster, Ulster University, I still can't get my head around to calling it by its new name, um, which has eaten up all of the financial transactions capital allocation for this year. There is a, a large £50 million allocation against this project for next year, uh, and obviously that project is subject to, to planning permission. Should that not go ahead, that creates a, a difficulty for me in terms of getting that money spent. And the broader point around this is that the creation of the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, which I announced in the draft budget uh, and topped up with a further allocation in the uh, final budget, is an opportunity for us to deposit money from financial transactions capital that may not be spent in year to be spent on projects in, in future years. So whilst I would be concerned if the project um, wasn't able to absorb that amount of money, I accept that it may not be able to because it is subject to planning and, and various other processes. Um, whilst it would create some difficulty for us in, in spending that, um, I will continue to encourage ministers to bring forward schemes that can, can use financial transactions capital so that we can use all of this quite new but very, very difficult source of funding to, to spend. And that is the end of questions uh, to the Minister of Finance.